Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in our series of webinars as part of the uh, the SBI's Irish Grasslands Project, sponsored by National Parks and Wildlife Service and the Center for Environmental Data and Recording. If you've joined the last three sessions, you'll have a good grounding in Grass ID by now, so it's time to move on to a new group. Today, Dr. Linda Weeks will be leading us through an introduction to sedge identification. I'm Sarah Pierce, the BSBI Ireland officer, and we also have Jim McIntosh, BSBI's senior country officer, on hand to help out. If you have any questions throughout today's session, please use the Q&A function. Jim and I will keep an eye on that while Linda is speaking. Uh, we'll answer what we can and we'll collate the rest for a Q&A session at the end. We really hope you enjoy the session and would be grateful if you could let us know what you think. A link to a feedback form will be sent out tomorrow. And thanks to everyone who filled that out for the previous weeks. For those just joining us, Linda is a lecturer at IT Tralee, lecturing in botany among many other topics. She previously worked as a grassland surveyor for the Burren program and for the National Biodiversity Data Center, collating I the Irish National Vegetation Database. She's a fantastic teacher, and we're very grateful to have her here with us today. So without further ado, over to you, Linda. Thanks a million, Sarah. Uh, and this morning, uh, as Sarah says, we're going to have a look at sedges. So, Sedges to most beginners are quite daunting and uh, they, the perception is that they're quite difficult and challenging to, um, to start and uh, to, to get to know. And to be honest, I, I agree as a beginner, they, they can be quite challenging. So um, what I hope to do today is break down things into um, simple points for you so that at least you can get started there's a, sedges there are a lot of sedges uh, and there's a lot of different types of sedges so we couldn't possibly cover everything in an hour today but i will try to cover as much as possible so that you'll have the tools to take it a step further after today and hopefully you will at least be able to identify 10 sedges um, relatively comfortably when you go out into the field. So I'll just share my um, presentation with you here. Uh, here we are. And we'll get straight to it. Okay, so um, first today, what we're gonna do is we're going to look at a brief introduction to what a sedge is, what type of sedges there are, and how many species do we have in Ireland? Now, I'm specifically, the species that we're dealing uh, with uh, are specific to Ireland, but you find them in the UK and uh, other countries, obviously, as well. But just in terms of species numbers, um, we're talking about Ireland specifically, um, because that's what I know about. I'm, I'm not sure about uh, how many species there are in the UK, et cetera. So, and then we'll give a brief, I'll give a brief outline um, and to the guides and keys that are available out there. And then we'll have a look at the sedge parts that are uh, important, floristic parts and vegetative features that are important for ID. And hopefully, at least at the end of this webinar, you'll know where to find those features and what to look for. Because when you're starting off and you're reading a key for the first time, you're not quite sure what you're actually looking at or what they're exactly whereabouts they are so hopefully at least by the end of this webinar you'll know where to go on the plant to find those things and then i'm going to give you some tips for id and uh, some example species that you can identify in the field so if you're an intermediate or an advanced sedge person uh, you probably you might pick up a few tips but it's really aimed at the beginner today. So what is a sedge? Uh, and I went into the differences between sedges, grasses and rushes there in the webinar, the, the, the first grass, vegetative grass ID webinar. So you're more than welcome to go onto the BSBI website and check that out. So in terms, I'm looking at it from a sedge point of view today. So a sedge is a grass-like plant, a graminoid, and it flowers, the flowers are important in that it has one gloom at the base of each flower. So um, that's the difference in, uh, that will distinguish it between rushes and sedges. And I'll explain that a little bit further in a, in a minute. 
So you have two broad groups of sedges. You have your true sedges, the Carex species. These are ones with male and female flowers that are completely separate from each other. They might be on the same plant, but they're separate, two different flowers. And uh, all the other sedges, there's a variety of uh, genera for the, the other sedges, but the flowers are both male and female in the same flower. So just like when you go out and see um, a flower with petals on it, you have your, uh, your female part, the stigma style and ovary, and then you have your male anthers and stamens there in the same flower. And likewise with the other sedges, you have your, your male and female parts within the same flower, but the true sedges, they're separate. So, oh, and the other thing about them is that the true sedges, the seed is enclosed in what, what's called a utricle. Now a utricle is like a little flask. It's a little flask shaped thing. You see it here? There is a little flask shaped utricle. Whereas in other sedges, you don't have any utricle. This here is your gloom, your, your, your scale, if you like here, and you'll see the little seed will uh, uh, be produced right here at the bottom, but it's not enclosed in a utricle. So um, you've seen this, if you were at the grass uh, vegetative um, you'll be familiar with this table, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. We concentrated on the vegetative features the last day in terms of grasses. But just to be aware that sedges have edges, mostly, not always, they tend to have triangular stems, not always, but tend to. Um, they're ligule then, which I'll explain where that is if you're new to this, is fused along the leaf length, except for the very, very top, in contrast to a grass where the ligule is actually just attached at the base and is free for the rest of it. But what we're interested in today are the flowers because we're looking at the flowering parts mainly today. And we're using the vegetative features then to back up our ID. So with the flowers then, uh, as I said, sedges, they generally have a utricle and a gloom, but the gloom is most important, just one gloom. Whereas if you've got a rush and you look at a flower, you'll see six scale like uh, pieces which are called segments in the rush. They're similar to a gloom, except there's six of them. And then if you're looking at a grass, you'll find two glooms at the base of your flower. So, and Fenula, at the very, very first webinar, went through uh, the floristic features of a grass. So if you need reminding, feel free to look at that. She explains it really well too. And then of course the fruits, if you like, we have our utricles for the true sedges. We have, uh, sorry, no, because this is covering up here yet. Uh, for rushes then, you tend to have a capsule with multiple seeds inside, whereas a sedge has one seed. And then for a, a grass, you have just one grain-like seed. But what we're really interested in is this blue highlighted region here. So let's just have a look at that and see what it, it's all very well in diagrams. Let's see what it looks like in reality. Whoops, sorry. So have a look at this. Um, let me just get rid of this here. Yeah, sorry, no, I, I see little icons here at the top. Now they're gone. So let's have a look at the sedge. Here is an inflorescence of a sedge. Now they can be, look different to this, but this is just an example. Here we have groups, uh, these are called spikes. These are groups of little utricles, little flowers here and these little groups up here. So we're gonna take one of these groups and we're going to take one little utricle out from this cluster here. And this is what it looks like on the left. And you have your utricle here. And if you look very carefully, the gloom is kind of see-through, but you can just make out the gloom here with a midrib. And if you have a look here, I've just taken the gloom off. So here's your utricle, your flask-like structure, and your gloom here. Now these, the utricle and the glooms are the key really for identification, along with other parts, but generally most keys are looking at the utricles and the glooms. 
and how the spikes or the, the inflorescence with these spikes of flowers look like. So in a rush, uh, you have, here is a cluster. Now, some people think, where am I looking at and what am I looking at? This is a group of flowers of a rush. So we want to see the six segments. So we actually have to take out one of these things. So here's one here. I'm just going to pick this out. And here it is close up. And if you have a look at one capsule, it's called a capsule here as opposed to a utricle. And in the caps around the capsule, you see six segments at the bottom. These can be folded out like a flower, if you like. But in this species, they're quite, uh, they're wrapped around the capsule, if you like. But if you see more than two, you know that you've got a, sometimes it's hard to see exactly six, but if you've got three, four, five, you, you know you've got a rush. And if you have a look over here at the grass then, here is a multi-flowered grass. This is a, 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 a spikelet here, but you've got a multi-flowered grass with lots of little flowers in here. But if you have a look at the very, very bottom, you'll find two scales and they're the glues. So whether it's a single flowered uh, one, uh, grass like this diagram up here with your, you'll still have two glooms with one flower inside. And there are other little, uh, little segments in here, which Fanula explains well, and I'm not going to go into those now, but just two glooms at the bottom. That's what you're looking for. So if we've got one gloom, we know we have a sedge. So how many sedges are there in Ireland? Well, we have 77, we think. That's not including the hybrids because there are hybrids as well, but we're not going to deal with hybrids today. We're just going to look at uh, uh, true species, if you like. So out of those 77 species, there are 13 genera altogether. They're listed here. And this is the number of species per genera. So Eriophorum, for example, is bog cotton. We have four bog cotton species in Ireland. Trichophorum is your deer sedge. We have two deer, species, deer sedge species in Ireland, etc. here. So we're going to have a look at the Carex species today. These are the true sedges. These are the ones where uh, the seed is enclosed in a utricle. That's the Carex. And these are examples of what Carexes look like. And I'll explain, uh, well, I've explained actually what a true sedge actually is. So we'll concentrate on these today. But I will just skim over the other genera here, just so that you're aware of what, they're, what they are and what they look like. So I'm not dealing with these today because there's, there's too many things to deal with today. And most people find the Carex as the most challenging. You'll see the other sedge genera, they're quite different. You have your bog cotton eriophorum, deer sedges, you have your black sedge here, et cetera, et cetera. They're all quite distinct from each other and perhaps easier to identify and not so challenging. So we leave those today and we will go on to what we need for Carex identification. So again, with grasses, you're dealing with, you need a hand lens, at least a times 10. And if you can get a combination of a times 10 and a times 20, that, that'll be great. You'll need a little ruler for measuring the different features that you find. And you'll need an ID guide or a guide of some sort or a key. And I'll just give you an outline of the keys today. So I suppose the best key that I'm aware of uh, in terms of its detail and uh, just every, it, des it describes the species very, very in detail, very, very well. Diagrams are really, really good. And it gives a really good outline of the habitats that they're found in and classification, et cetera. And this is your BSB, BSB by handbook. Now there are two versions to be aware of. Uh, the third edition is the latest version. The great thing about this is there's floristic key to all sedges, the true sedges and all the other sedges as well. It's more up to date uh, with names and classification, great diagrams and detailed descriptions. The only thing is that it's a, a quite a thick book. It's not a book that you'd likely take out into the field with you. 
and it's only got a floristic key. It doesn't have a vegetative key in it. But the good thing about this is, because I know some of you are interested in habitats as well, it's got a really good table of all the sedge, sedges species with uh, Ellenberg values uh, scored for light, moisture, pH, etc., etc. So it's really, really good if you're interested in sedges as indicators. It's 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 got that in it, whereas the older version doesn't. The second edition, you'll get it cheaper, but it's much thinner, so you can bring it out in the field quite easily. But it doesn't have all the other sedges. It just does the Carex species, the true sedges only. But it does have a vegetative key to those, which the new version doesn't. So uh, the other thing is that it has outdated names. Uh, taxonomy has moved on a little bit since. So, but again, great diagrams and detailed descriptions. Really, really good. And again, it's the keys can be quite challenging for a beginner, but it's well worth getting it even for the diagrams when you're starting off. So um, a simpler key and uh, guide, I suppose, would be the Francis Rose. And again, I, I recommended this for the grasses as well, because it includes grasses, sedges, rushes and ferns. And as a result, you, you're not going to have as much detail, just a paragraph per species, really. But again, it's a really great starter one um, and really good colored diagrams. There's a, an example just down there below. So again, really good, but not a great one to bring into the field because it's quite a big book. This one on the right here, uh, the field guide to sedges and rushes. I'm not very familiar with this uh, by uh, price, uh, but if anybody uh, would like to comment about this, I, uh, to give feedback to people, I'd be very grateful. Uh, all I know, I've just seen it very briefly. It's got really nice photos. It doesn't do all species. The it's a select number of species in it, uh, which is a bit of a disadvantage, but again, uh, lovely coloured photographs in it. So if anybody would like to comment on that at the end uh, to give some people some information about it, great. See how you feel about it if, if you're familiar with this book. Now, uh, just to let you be aware that if you're looking for something that you can bring out in the field, and uh, that is aimed at beginners, intermediate. Uh, we, I, I know there's a lot of people waiting for this for a long time and I sound like a broken record, but it, it's actually in plan now. It's just been final edits at the moment. So this, uh, if you're familiar and you're a fan of the grass guide, the National Biodiversity Grass Guide, um, we're bringing out a, a sedge guide now this Christmas. So. If you're interested in that, hopefully that will be available. Well, it will be available this Christmas. Same format as the grass guide. So what if you don't have a, gu a guide at all and you want to start straight away? Is there anything free out there? And yes, there is. There's a really good guide that the, uh, from Hampshire in England that the hansplants.org brought out. Really, really good. Um, it doesn't do all the species, it only has a key to the species that occur in Hampshire in England, uh, but it covers a lot of the Irish sedges and a lot of the sedges that you'll find elsewhere in the UK as well. And it covers both true sedges and the other sedges as well. And it's really good. So you can download that for free. Uh, the link is there and I actually gave, it, gave the link to uh, Sarah and hopefully there'll be a link on the website sometime. So it's a great one to start, start with to bring out really good diagrams and everything as well. So um, just before we start into the actual details about sedges, just to remember, just like the grasses, features are small. They're, sometimes they're really tiny. So you do need a hand lens. And to use a hand lens correctly, the video link is there that I had before, so you're welcome to look at that. Uh, it's not me, I just found it on, on YouTube. It's, it's, it's a useful little um, video to, to look at. And the features that you're seeing in this presentation today are magnified many times. So I think for beginners, sometimes, uh, you know, 
to find these things, we don't realize just how tiny and small they are. So just to be aware of that, you need to get really, really close to the sedge and the parts to identify them. So let's have a look at a true sedge structure and the terminology that's important. So we're looking at Carex species. Flowers are unisex, so you either have male or female flowers. Here is a typical sedge diagram of, of a plant here. Here is a real one. Uh, now, as you'll see as we go on, some sedges look a bit different, but just a typical sedge here, just to show the parts. So in this one here, you have a male spike. The inflorescence, first of all, is this whole stretch here that includes all the flowers. So in this, the inflorescence is the part of the plant that includes all the flowers. So from here up to the top. And if we have a look separately here, you have your male flowers in a male spike at the top. You have your female flowers, or, uh, which are made up of a cluster of utricles here. And there's another spike with more female flowers in it. You have some at the base of your spike, you may have bracts. This one looks like a leaf, but they can look like little um, bristles or they can look like a gloom or a scale if you like, but in this case, they look leaf-like. Those bracts can be important. The length of those bracts can be important for ID. And then if you have a look at the leaf here, oops, sorry. Here is the actual leaf here, as opposed to the bract. The bract, you'll know it's a bract if it's at the base of the flower. And you can have bracts at the base of the male flower sometimes too. So here's the leaf here. And if you have a look at the base of the leaf, where it attaches to the stem, you have your sheath down here. And at this junction where the leaf is, that's where your ligule is. And that's where you'll find the top of the sheath. The shape of the top of the sheath can be important for ID as well. Now the female spike, this is a male spike. Just to be aware, sometimes you might have a spike that has both. So you have female here, at the bottom and a male male is at the top here now they can be interspersed as well depending on what species and what type of sedge you have but just to be aware sometimes they're still separate male and female flowers but they just happen to be in the same spike so and of course you have rhizomes as well that are underground horizontal stems and these can be important in uh, telling you whether you have a plant which I'll explain in a sec or a creeping one. So let's have a look if you have rhizomes that are very very short you're not going to have a sort of a, a creeping well spread out plant you're going to have it tussocky looking or maybe tufted. So tufts are really small little tufts of, of sedges whereas tussocks are large big hummocks if you like. So if you've got short rhizomes, this is the sort of growth habit you'll have. And I'll show you uh, an example shortly of uh, a sedge that has really long rhizomes and you'll see what that looks like shortly. So what features should I examine? I know this is a really busy slide, so hopefully um, you can have a look back at this if you need to at some stage, but just for now, um, I've just put it all on one page so at least you know where the parts are, I suppose. So the first thing you examine are your, is your inflorescence and you determine if you've got male and female flowers in a single spike or in a separate spike. So these are separate spikes here, one spike, two spikes, three spikes. So some sedges, carexes, have just a single spike with their both male and female flowers in one spike, separate, but in one spike. This, this example, they're separate. So if it's single, you have three species, which we'll have a look at shortly. If you've got several separate spikes, then you need to see if they're the same in appearance, you'll have 15 species. But if they're different in appearance, like in this case, you have 32 species. So again, this will be clear when we have a look at examples in a short while. And 
I suppose for identification purposes, we're not so interested in the male spike. Sorry, all you men out there, we're more interested in the females. So we're looking at the female spikes for identification purposes, the shape uh, of the spike itself, the distance those spikes are from each other, and the presence and length of bracts. And then within the spike, we look at the utricles and we look at their shape, whether they're hairy, hairless, the number of stigma, and I'll show you ways to tell that, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail a little bit later on. Just the stigma is the part, the female part, that sticks outside the utricle when the sedge is flowering. So here on the right-hand side, this is a three-branch stigma, if you like. There's three little branches coming out of it. The stigma is what catches the pollen, uh, that then the pollen fertilizes the, the, the ovary inside, the ovum inside to produce the seed. Sometimes this can be two branched. In this case, it's three here and it can be really difficult. This is something that is very common in the keys and for a beginner, it's really hard to, to decide sometimes, but we'll look at that now shortly. Uh, then glooms, uh, the glooms are the other little scale like um, scales at the base of the utricles. What shape are they? What colour are they? They're mid ribs in the middle. What colour are they in relation to the rest of the gloom, etc, etc. And then transfer section can be useful, not key uh, like the utricles and the efflorescence, but it can help back up ID. Um, most, as I say, sedges are triangular in transfer section. Some are more rounded, as you can see here, and some are very acutely, sharply triangular, and that can help an ID as well. Leaves, then, we look at the colour, the width, and the transfer section. So here we have an example of a green leaf, and here we have an example of a grey-green leaf. So it's kind of blue-grey colour, glaucus is what it's referred to. That can be really important to decipher between two very similar species. If there's grey-green on both sides of the leaf or grey-green on the upper surface or the lower surface, some leaves can be dark green on top and glaucous underneath or vice versa. So just to be aware of that. And then your leaves, the transfer section, some of them can be C-shaped, some of them can be V-shaped, some of them can be M-shaped, and some of them can be quite bristly and uh, tightly curled, if you like. So, um, and the M-shaped one can be referred to as plicate. So just to be aware that leaf shape can be important as well. And looking at the ligules then, by the way, these, this diagram here, six refers to the location of your ligule. So six and seven, the sheath and ligule are found here. So the ligules then, they can be pointed, they can be rounded, or they can actually be tubular in some species. Sheets, the, sh the color is important in some cases, and the shape at the top of the sheath opposite the ligule. So you have your leaf coming out this side, it's the opposite side to the leaf then, you'll have the shape of the sheath at the top. Some you can have a tongue-like projection, Sometimes it's just slightly convex, curved upwards. Sometimes it can be flat. Sometimes it can be concave. It can be uh, sort of curved downwards. That can be important as well. And finally, rhizomes uh, will tell you whether uh, if there's lots of rhizomes uh, and long rhizomes, the plant will be well spread out and there'll be single plants spread in an area. Whereas if it's tussocky, um, or tufted, you'll have really short rhizomes and the, it'll be a real compact plant. So how can we use these features then to break down our 50 species that we find in Ireland? So if we start here with the first group, we'll take these ones. So this is our list of 50 species. Let's take the first three. These three are single flowering spike. And we just have three species of those. So uh, in other words, there's just one spike. And in that one spike, you have your female and male flowers. 
but it's done one spike. Now, uh, here, this is a, the dioecious sedge, which is Carex dioica. So you have one spike here, but you might notice that it's all utricles, it's all female. So where are the male flowers? Well, in fact, in this case, uh, the sedge has two separate plants. They have male plants and female plants. So if you have a female uh, dioecious sedge, you'll see all the utricles just in one spike. If you come across a male plant, it'll just be uh, the male spike will be on the plant. So these are really, really small. And actually, this is so small, you might actually miss it. It's quite a really short little species and it's very much overlooked by beginners because they just don't see it it's quite small. So uh, that's one single spike. Now it's okay generally in fens and flushes. So keep an eye out for that one. Another one that's more common, uh, again, it's a really small one, but it's a really striking one when you see it. It's one of my favorite, actually. It's called the flea sedge, and you'll see why, because the utricles look like little fleas stuck to the spike. So in this case, it's a single spike, but you have your male flowers, the thin part on top, and you have your utricles sticking out, your female part sticking out further down the spike, looking like little fleas. So again, bogs, heath, mountain pastures, doesn't, doesn't mind what sort of pH or anything. You'll find it quite, it's widespread um, throughout different habitats. One that's very, very rare that you're unlikely to come across, but if you're up north, keep an eye out for it. Up north in Ireland, I'm talking about, that's the Carex pocky flora, which is the few flowered sedge. Very distinctive utricles little yellow, thin, pointy ones here with a tiny little male on top here. Um, so keep an eye out in Northern Ireland, but it's very rare. And if you're in the South of Ireland, you're unlikely to come across it. But it's no harm to keep, out, keep an eye out for these rare uh, species because sometimes we can find new records. So that's single flowered spike. What if we've got several spikes in, um, we can split them up into several spikes. We have 15 species that have several spikes that look similar in appearance. So they look, all the spikes look kind of identical. So here is an example here. The one, two spikes, three, four, they all look very, very similar. Here, one spike, two spikes, three spikes, really look similar as well. So where are the males? You can have them in the diagram, but with these ones, you have your female utricles, your female flowers, and interspersed in these can be the male plants, or the male flowers. Uh, in my experience, I'm, unless you've got your stamens and anthers and your, your female parts like the stigma showing, uh, if you, if you catch the plant when it's actually actively flowering, you can see the difference between the male and female. But if it's gone over and it's fertilized and it's developing into its seed, very, very hard to tell where the males are particularly. So, and in, a, in the keys for these species, they can be really challenging because sometimes it asks, are the male flowers at the base or are they at the top? Uh, in relation to the female flowers and sometimes well I find that it's really really difficult to tell sometimes so that can be very challenging when you're keying them out but there is a different approach you can have a look at the brack or the glooms instead and the NBDC uh, guide that's come out uses a different approach to other keys that are available if you get to that stage where you've got to say whether the male flowers are on top or on the bottom, and you really don't know, the best advice I can give you is follow one option first, see where it brings you in the key, and does it match your description of the species that you have? And if it doesn't, go back to that option and take the other away. That's, that's really the only way that you can, unless somebody can give some advice at the end of this webinar, I'd be, I'd be delighted. So let's have a look just at a few species, uh, three species that uh, you may find in this group with similar spikes. So the first one 
is if you're on the coast, look out for this one, the sand sedge, Carex arenaria. And I'm giving you this one because it's a good example of creeping rhizomes. Can you see here in the photograph, you've got lots of little isolated plants rather than all in a big bunch. And if you, it's, it's really interesting because when the first time I saw this, they, they pop up singly in a long line across the sand. And actually you can follow the rhizome um, the diagram or the photograph there doesn't show it very clearly, but you can actually, if you find one and then you find another and you'll find another, they actually follow a line throughout the sand. It's really interesting. So keep an eye out for that one. Um, and you'll notice that there's a bract at the bottom of the inflorescence and it's quite short as well. So have a look out for that one. Very, very obvious creeping rhizomes in a, in a line. If you're in a shady place, look out for the grey sedge. Uh, Carex divulza, subspecies divulza. Now I'm putting a subspecies in here because if you're in Ireland, the only grey sedge that we have is Carex divulza, subspecies divulza. If you're in England, you'll have other subspecies, but the only one that occurs in Ireland is the subspecies divulza. So I've included it here. So you're looking for a tufted plant, You'll notice that the spike, uh, the, the inflorescence, all the spikes look the same, but they're quite, um, they're spread out. There's quite a distance between each one. Here's one spike here. And if you have a close look at the gloom, it's see-through, translucent with a green midrib. Uh, there is a very similar one that you're likely to come across in the same habitat. That's Carex remota, the remote sedge that looks very, very similar to, to divulza. The difference is that it has these big, long bracts. Do you see these that look like leaves? So there's your inflorescence just here. And this is the start of the bract. This is your stem here. So the bract is really long. Whereas in divulza, there are bracts, but they're very short. And finally, if you're in a boggy place and you find a sedge that looks very starry, like the spikes look very starry, you're likely to have the, the star sedge, Carex echinata. So it's densely tufted and you'll notice that the um, little spikes are much, much closer together. There's very little distance between them. They're clustered at the top of the plant. Um, star-like, the utricles are arranged in a star-like pattern and it's likely that you have the star sedge. So those are examples of uh, uh, sedges that have um, spikes that different spikes, but they all look pretty similar. The majority of uh, Carex species um, are in the next group. These are sedges that have several spikes, but they're two different spikes. So you have your male spike, usually at the top, and your female spikes that have your utricles usually further down the plant. So there's a big group here. Uh, so let's see, 32 species. We can subdivide these into a few more groups, which we'll show you now. So here is a group within these uh, carexes that have two different spikes. Sorry, just to, just to uh, clarify here. Here's your one, two, three spikes. That's your male spike there. And uh, here's two female spikes at the bottom here. So they're two different. And here we have one, two, three female spikes. And then you have your male spike up here. So that's a typical sedge that we're more familiar with that we just we we kind of get it a bit muddled up sometimes on how to identify these but if you have hairy utricles if you have a look at the utricles and they're hairy you've got one of four species so here is the most hairiest most obvious one is the hairy sedge surprise surprise carex herta you'll find it in damp wet meadows and grasslands and uh, the whole spike the female spike looks quite hairy and the leaves are hairy, and also sheaths are hairy. So it's a particular hairy sedge. You can't really mistake it for anything else. And just, I've got these diagrams in. This is your utricle, your gloom, 
the cross section, transfer section of your stem and the transfer section of the leaf. So you'll see these uh, throughout the, the rest of the presentation. So just to explain what this, these are here. So the other species that are hairy, you need to look really, really closely. Actually, uh, they're not as obvious. You need to look closely at the utricles because it's sometimes at the base of the utricles, they might be hairy, but the rest might not be. So uh, for the other three species, look very, very carefully. But with the hairy sedge, it's quite obvious. So what about the rest of the species in this group? Well, we can split up this uh, number of species here. If we have a look at the utricle itself and we see that it's got a beak. Now in the keys they say is, is the utricle beaked or not. And basically what you're looking at is here's your utricle here. Do you see this little neck here? If it has a little neck, like a little flask, that is the beak. Now, sometimes the beak isn't that obvious. Here's the beak here in a diagram, different shaped beaks. Here's a very short beak here. If you're not sure whether you have a beak because the beak is so short, look at the tip and if forked, you can take it that you have a beak. So forked or notched uh, at the tip and beaked. That will get you into this group here. And you can see here, there's the gloom. This one is quite swollen because it's uh, fertilized and it's later on in the season. It has glooms that are small anyway, small little brown gloom here with a pale midrib. So you can see the different colors compared to the translucent gloom that we saw previously with the green midrib. So let's just have a look at, uh, let's just split these up further. And I'll just take one example from this group to show you. So if we split this, so here we have hairless utricles with a beak, all these. Let's take these five species here. These are ones that have hair, hairless utricles with a beak. But if you have a look carefully at the sheath of this plant, it has a tongue-like projection at, at the, the top of the sheath. And if you have a tongue-like projection, you know you've got one of these species here. So I've just taken one of these as an example because it's a common species and you're likely to come across it and it's very widespread. And that's the green-ribbed sedge, Carex by Nervous. Now, um, in terms of this tongue-like projection, look at the flowering stems and don't just look at one, just look at several because sometimes the tongue can't, isn't obvious on all stems. But the, just higher up on the stem, the tongue-like projection should be apparent there. So if you've got Keris by Nervous, you've got your tongue-like projection, and very often, look very carefully with the hand lens, you've got a groove down your stem as well, which is a real, that, that's a diagnostic feature of this species as well. Um, and you have, if you have a look at the inflorescence, your lowest female spike is quite distance, distance from the rest of them, and it's drooping downwards. And it can be quite a long spindly uh, sedge um, that's sort of, it's kind of delicate and spindly in places. And yet if, if the ground is in better condition, you, it can be quite robust. So you're really looking for the groove and the tongue here, um, and you most likely have Carex by nervous. So you'll find it on heaths and upland grasslands mainly. Now I'm not going to look at these in detail, but just to say, to get this group of four, you're looking at the female spike shape. So the shape tends to be rounded or short and stumpy, as you can see here, not longer, uh, not long and thin. Whereas if you take this subgroup here, these female spikes tend to be very long and thin and dangly. Most of them are stalked. And if they don't have stalks, but they're, they're longer than they're, they're much longer, they're more cylindrical really than more shorter, if you like there. So that care of that group there. The next two groups then are the uh, utricles are hairless again. They're beakless, so they don't have any beaks 
or if they have a short beak, their little, um, their very tips are not forked or notched. So we call this truncate. They look like just like a little, the top of a little flask. Um, they're just rounded at the top. So there's no notch, no fork, and there's no beak. And if you're, you're unsure, uh, beaked versus not beaked, you have a, a truncate or rounded top. So to split these up then further, this is the a lot of this is a feature that's in a lot of keys, and it can be really difficult as a beginner to decipher whether there's the stigma is too branched like this one, two on top, or whether the stigma is three branched like this here. Now the diagram makes it look lovely and clear, but have a look here at this photograph. Um, these are the stigmas here and they're all intertangled with each other. And I spent uh, ages uh, as a beginner looking at these flipping things, trying to decipher whether there's two or three. And one minute I see three of them and I go, oh yeah, there's three. And then I think count again and there's two and I get so confused. Down here, you can see that there's three, one, two, three. But again, these can be very intertwined and tangled and can be very difficult. And then not only that, if it's finished flowering, those stigmas drop off and you don't have them at all. So you're really kind of stumped. So just to give you a general guide as to how to get past this difficulty if you're unsure, have a look at the shape of the utricle itself. So utricles that generally have two stigmas tend to be really kind of much more flattened. So they tend to be oval, flattened and like, like a round cushion basically. So if I cut this in half here and looked at it in transverse section, it would look quite flattened on either side and cushion-like. Whereas if you've got three stigmas, uh, it looks more triangular in cross section or quite rounded, uh, convex on either side, as you can see here. So it looks rounded, or triangular, you have three stigmas. If it looks quite flattened, you have two stigmas. So I use this feature more than counting stigmas, really, unless it's really fresh and in the, in, in the prime of its flowering. And I'm going to show you two similar species that uh, I used to get confused with as a beginner that have uh, two stigmas and three stigmas, but look very similar to each other. And, uh, just to show you the difference between the two and how, how different they do look once you know what you're looking for. So I'm going to take Carex niger from this group to show you a two stigma uh, flowering plant. And I'm going to take Carex, where is it here? Carex panacea then to compare a three stigmat flowering plant. So, Let's have a look at the two stigma one here. This is Carex by, uh, oh, that, that's a mistake. Uh, apologies for that. That is not, uh, I'll correct that. Um, so I'm glad I saw that myself now this time. That is actually Carex nigra. That is not uh, green. Let me just double check that. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that. Apologies for that. Just double check that at the end and I'll confirm with you then. But basically what you're looking at is Carex uh, nigra here. And you can see that the utricles look really flattened. Do you see that? So they're really kind of flattened cushions. You've got uh, your utricles very black and rounded and egg shaped. And if you look really closely, you'll see a little white margin around the outside there. So flattened, you don't have to really worry about the stigmas. And the thing about the leaves is that they're blue green on both sides. So check a fresh specimen. If you're, if you're taking specimens in a plastic bag and taking them home and you look at them the next day or a few days after, the glaucous green color disappears. It kind of just, it's very difficult to tell. So if you're looking at a glaucous green color, you need to look at fresh specimens, either growing or within the day that you're looking at them. 
So this is very common on marshes, wet grassland and riversides. Now let's have a look at uh, Carex panacea in contrast. You can see, look at the, the utricles here, they're very rounded. So that would signify that there's three little stigmas. So they're not really triangular uh, in shape as some of them are. In this case is an example of a rounded utricle. So they're very rounded, quite swollen. Um, and here's the leaves showing you that they're kind of glaucous green. And you'll often find them growing in um, wet heath, blanket bog and grassland. And you'll often find the uh, Carex nigra and this sedge, Carex panacea, growing close to each other in the same habitat. So to decipher them, they both have the same leaf sort of color. Uh, they uh, both are sedges that have um, female and male spikes, but you're looking here at the utricle shape, basically. Okay, so that shows you uh, Carex panacea there. So how are we doing for time? Okay, so that just gives you a whistle stop tour around the various types of sedges that you'll find. So just to finish up with, I hope I'm not finishing too early, uh, but hopefully you can inwardly digest all the information that, that is there because some of the slides are very packed. So what is essential is, is to buy a hand lens is to practice, and uh, as I said, this is the same slide I actually gave for the grasses, but in terms of sedges, it really does take patience and effort. Uh, grass, there's more grass species, but I think grasses are more straightforward than sedges. Sedges are challenging, but don't give up. And what I would say about sedges too, if you're looking at, if you're using uh, the keys, like say, for example, in the sedge guide here, at the BSBI book, um, one thing that uh, leads off beginners is the terminology that's used. Um, it's, it's sometimes a different language. Say, for example, stems, are they terete or not? Uh, and terete means rounded, basically. Are leaves plicate or not? And plicate basically means uh, folded. Um, so there's lots of different terminology that you have to sort of get over and it can be quite slow. The good thing is that those books have a glossary at the back so you can look up the meaning of each term. But at the beginning, that takes a long time. You're looking at a, uh, the key and you come across a word you don't know. You have to go and look the word up and then come back and then you kind of find that you're lost in the key. Where were you? It takes patience and it takes persistence, but stick with it because you will get there. And once you become familiar with the terminology, and the approaches of those keys, you'll be surprised how quickly then you progress. The beginning is the slow, slow part. It's like a curve, it's just a flat curve, and then suddenly you'll start learning at a much greater rate. So do stick with it. Uh, don't lose heart, because uh, it is challenging. And do seek help and support. As I said to you before, join a uh, local naturalist group, uh, find a local botanist uh, and the BSBI are a great organization, voluntary organization um, and organize lots of uh, field outings and stuff. Hopefully when COVID is restrictions are, are clear and we're free to meet again um, more regularly. Um, it's well worth joining and going out on BSBI um, field days. So, each counterland has a BSBI recorder that you can contact uh, for ad advice. Um, and do record your species. And if you're confident about the identification, do keep a record of it and do submit your records either to the BSBI or your country's biodiversity data center or wildlife data center of some sort. In the south of Ireland, it's the National Biodiversity Data Center. So they're really, really important, as I say, even if they're common plants, it's really, really important. So there's a few links there. And hopefully I'm just going to check uh, the photographs that I've got the right photographs in the right place. And I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. 
um, thank you very much. I hope it wasn't all thrown at you and hopefully you've picked up tips that you need to know. So over to you, um, Sarah and Jim, wait in the seat. Thanks very Thank much, you. Linda. That was a really great introduction to what, as you rightly say, can be a very challenging group, especially for beginners. Um, hopefully people found it useful. The slides are already up on the website, but I will update them with that correction you highlighted in a little yeah, while. Yeah, thanks a million. Thank you. <laughs> we uh, do have a few questions that have come through. Jim, do you want to start us off? Uh, yes, a question about uh, ligules. Uh, how do you measure uh, the length of a ligule on a sedge? Uh, it, it's much easier to grasp, but it's a bit, the ligules are a bit different, aren't they? Yeah, and that's, that's one thing that used to catch me out. I got so confused about where do you start or end with a, with a, a sedge ligule because the ligule is, uh, let's see if I can get up a diagram. Oh no, never mind. But the ligule is attached to the length of the leaf practically and then you've only got a very um, top bit that might be sort of not attached or stuck to the leaf. So if you're measuring ligules, the best thing to do, most keys, uh, their measurements are taken from the part that is not attached to the leaf. So if you're not sure where the ligule starts or ends, just look at the part that's actually unattached at the very, very top. That's the part to measure. So generally they form little triangles on the surface of the leaf. So it's the very, from the very bottom of that triangle to the very apex, the very tip of the triangle. Is that right? That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. And they're and not always be... triangular. Sometimes they can be quite rounded as well. But generally uh, in triangular stemmed ones, they tend to be pointed and triangular. Yeah. And they can be quite a distinctive feature and on some sedges like uh, Carax levigata, they're incredibly long. They can be 15, cent uh, 15 millimetres uh, yeah. or even longer. Yeah, absolutely. So they can be actually really, uh, really good for, for confirmation of the species that you have. And, you know, if you're using a vegetative key, they're even more important. But we won't go into vegetative keys today. Uh, that's, an, uh, that's a whole other... Uh, get to know the sedges in flower first, because they're even more difficult than grasses to identify with vegetative features. But you can. Uh, another question um, uh, from Eamon, and he's asking about leaf widths and uh, how they can be used as, as an to, to distinguish similar species. And he particularly t talks about binervus and levigata. Um, to, to what extent can you use leaf widths to help you? Yeah, leaf widths are very important as well. And uh, yeah, they're, they could, put it this way, the, uh, sort of my approach anyway, I, I would uh, identify a sedge as best I can with the floristic features first. And then I would back up my identification with looking at other features like the leaves, the ligules, the sheets. So it's important, uh, definitely leaf width is important because some species have thinner leaves, some species have wider leaves, and also how plicate they are, how, you know, if they're M-shaped or C-shaped in transverse section. So leaf shape, width and length can be really really important and it can it can be uh, when you've got similar species uh, within the same group of features if you like then leaf width comes into its own and yes it is thanks it seems like you must have done well on the floristic features because there's more questions about vegetative features and <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so a couple of people were asking about how easy it is to distinguish the ligule from the top of the sheath um, and more generally any kind of review of, of the features at the top of the sheath that people need to be looking at. Okay, so on the top of the sheath, uh, let me see if I just, if I get up my, my um, 
presentation again just uh, it might help. Uh, let me just see now. So just in in terms of the sheath where we should be here. Yeah, I've only just put in a few examples. So here, here's the top of the sheath here. So on the top of the sheath, which is here's your sheath and here's the junction of the leaf. So where the junction of the leaf is coming out, that's where you're, you're going to look for your ligule. So again, it's, Hi, Linda, if you can, can you just highlight that again, because it was a bit slow coming up. Oh, sorry. Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're looking at the sheath. You might be able to see my pointer there. Junction of where the leaf is here. And where the junction of the leaf is, that's where you're going to find your ligule. So uh, your ligule can be tubular all the way around. It can be very sharply triangular. It can be rounded. Um, and just opposite where your ligule is and opposite the leaf. So the leaf is on one side. Your stem is in between these features here. It's the top of the sheath here. The shape of the top of the sheath is, is, can be very important as well, particularly if you're looking at vegetative keys. This is your tongue-like projection, like your carex by nervous we had a look at. It can be convex, not so tongue-like, but just convex, pointing up or shaped upwards, curved downward or flat. So those are the areas around the leaf junction that you need to be looking at, the top of the sheath. So the leaf side is your ligule and opposite that then are your sheath tops. So hopefully that clarifies things there. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, Jim. Um, yes. Just to pick up on that point uh, about um, Carex nigra, uh, you, you put a, uh, a slide up uh, showing Carex nigra, and, but it was entitled Carex by Nervous. It, it really was nigra. You, 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 yeah, it's nigra. You, yeah, 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 it is. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, yeah. So apologies and, and, and for that. Another thing about um, names. Uh, Louise asks, uh, where was Carex ovalis? Well, Carex ovalis, good question. Carex ovalis has actually changed its name. So if you have the BSBI SEDGE guide, the older version, this one here, uh, it probably looks backwards to you, I'm not sure with the camera, but uh, it's Carex ovalis in this one. But it's actually changed its name now. So in the updated version, this one, and you can see how thick it is, compared to this. Uh, it's Carex leporina now. So that's where Carex ovalis has gone. It's got a new name. Leporina is what it's called now. Thanks. Bit of a different question moving on from ID. Someone was asking, uh, has climate change and the increase in imported plants had an impact on our native sedges, perhaps in terms of pests and disease? I'm not aware of any specific research on this do you have any idea no I'm, I'm not and maybe Jim you have you might have uh, more knowledge on that one uh, no I'm not aware of any any um, any research or, or, or findings on that line it's an interesting question um, and maybe anybody out there that's thinking of uh, postgraduate research it, it might be well an interesting topic but no, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not aware of any research on that end of things, unless anybody else is that would like to suggest or contribute or say anything there about that. Oh. Always good to have an interesting question, even if you can't answer it. Yeah, it's a good thing to, th to think about, actually, yeah, because no doubt, you know, climate change is impacting biodiversity of all types of species, so there's no reason why it shouldn't be impacting on, on um, sedge distribution and, and sedge, um, what sedges we have here. So, and I'm not aware, like with grasses, say for example, we, we do have grasses that are imported, you know, uh, especially around our ports and things, casual species that turn up every now and again. 
that are more typical of maybe warmer climes that survive here for short periods of time. But I'm not aware of any sedges that come in. That's a, that's a question maybe for Paul Green uh, of the BSBI because he's he finds all sorts of strange things um, uh, around the country. So that might be a question to put to him sometime. Hmm. Okay, <clears throat> a question about uh, trigonous tips. How reliable are they as a distinguishing feature? I think uh, the, the um, person asking the question is particularly thinking of Carex panacea and Carex flacca. What do you say about that? Yeah, uh, trigonous tips um, for Carex panacea, Carex flacca, yeah, it's a good feature, but there are far other more obvious features that uh, can help you, I suppose, in identifying those two species. Uh, where I would use trigonous tips really um, are for the bog cottons, if they're not flowering, um, that can be really important. But uh, trigonous tips, yeah, it's, it's a good feature. Um, yeah, it, it's good, but I, I wouldn't use it as the, the first go-to feature. I would use other features first and then use trigonous tips, I suppose, to, to back up your ID. But yes, I mean, they're pretty reliable and they're used in vegetative sedge keys. So um, I would, I would, I would uh, rely on them in terms of, if they're in, particularly in, in this sedge key here, they talk about trigonous tips and I would be, I would think that would be a reliable, I, I've, in my experience, I found it reliable anyway. But it's it's a it's a feature, as I say, that I would use secondary to other features first. Thank you. We've had a question here asking: uh, Are sedges mostly linked with unimproved habitats, and in that way, would they be good indicators of habitat quality? Yeah, well, certainly um, sedges tend to be uh, good indicators of uh, good habitat quality. Yes, they do. Uh, they um, they score, say, for example, the, the Burren program in the west of Ireland in County Clare in Burren there, where we have limestone, uh, karst landscape and dry calcareous grasses. One of, there are many scoring regimes, but one of them, one feature is you, 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 you'd score higher if you had sedges in your grasses. In your in your fields, say for example. So, yeah, and they're the first really to go when there's a, you know agriculturally improved grasslands. Uh, they're kind of one of the species to disappear pretty quickly. So yes, they are good indicators of a good quality habitat, taking into consideration the biodiversity of other plants available as well. I mean, if you've got a really good high quality high biodiversity grassland, say for example, or heathland. You're going to Are many of our sedges threatened by extinction? Uh, that's a good question, and uh, I didn't look up the red list before. If anybody's interested, uh, the best place to go, I gave a link the last day with the vegetative grass uh, webinar two there. And I think Sarah put up the uh, Irish red list mm -hmm. uh, on the website uh, that the National Parks and Wildlife Service devised. So I would suggest that if you are interested in, in finding out which ones are rare or threatened, the best thing to do is to go to that red list and have a look at the various different lists that they have for vulnerable, near threatened, threatened, um, et cetera, in, in the red list. You'll find the answers to that question there. And one more ID question has come through saying, I realize you're not covering vegetative tea keys, but any tips on looking for stomata on leaves? Ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that is, if you get into the vegetative um, side of things, for sedges, some sedges, like stomata, just for people who might know what stomata are, there are tiny little pores on the usually on the underside of leaves that open and close uh, to regulate 
water loss from a plant in general. And sedges, uh, like other plants, tend to have their stomata on the underside of the leaf under here. So there are some sedges that actually have stomata on the upper side of the leaf, and that can be um, a, a distinguishing feature when picking the sedge that you don't have the flower for. Um, those sedges that have stomata on the upper side of the leaf tend, or the, tend to be have a lighter a lighter sort of shade of green on top than underneath. But um, with a hand lens, you're not going to really see stomata very clearly, unless uh, Jim or Sarah, if you've got uh, ideas. But um, you'd really have to look closely with a higher magnification to double check. I know in the Poland, um, Poland's uh, BSBI, the vegetative key, it's an important feature for stomata. Generally, the shade gives you an idea, though, if the stomata are on the upper surface, the shade tends to be slightly lighter, uh, but again, much closer identification with, with a, a stronger magnification you'd have to check out. Related to that, uh, Eamon just said that um, the way the leaf curls on drying can, can help to be indicative of where the stomata are as well. Oh, good. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a good tip. Mm -hmm. See, um, I, I love learning when I'm doing things for other people to learn. I love to learn as I go along as well. Thanks for that tip. Didn't know that one. Great. Right. Jim, were there any other questions you saw come through? I think we've covered most of them. Uh, I'm just scanning through the list. Have we missed any? Um, ah, there's a, there's, this is not so much a question, but um, a statement of fact. But um, uh, it, it's uh, about the states and, and pointing out it is actually pretty good for keying out sedges. Um, right. Who is making that point? So many questions here. I can't I think spot that was Joshua. It. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of keys for beginners, another one that I, I haven't had a chance to see for myself, but which I've been told is is useful is start to identify sedges and rushes by Faith Anstey. Um, so that might be another one to look out Great. for if, if you're finding some of the the more complex keys a bit daunting to start off with. Something you could look into. Great. And that's a book, Sarah, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a small book. Can order it online. Uh, but as I say, I haven't seen it for myself. Um, okay, great. But I've heard some good things. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, I think yeah, we should probably leave it there. If there's no other questions for the second. Thank you once again, no. Linda. That was another great session. Um, we'll try and get a recording up sometime this week, assuming nothing's gone wrong with the recording. Uh, huge thanks to NPWS and CEDAR once again for funding the Irish Grasslands Project. And hopefully we'll yep. see many of you back in two weeks time when Benula O'Neill will be doing our introduction to NX1 grassland habitats, which should be a good one. Thanks again.